Wie bewerten Sie die neue russische Strategie der Raketen- und Kamikaze-Drohnenkampagne gegen die ukrainische Energieinfrastruktur? How do you evaluate the new Russian strategy of missile and kamikaze drone campaign against Ukrainian energy infrastructure? The, the targeting of uh, a nation's energy infrastructure during a time of war is a legitimate um, military target, even though it has dual use capabilities. Uh, and even if the primary um, use of the energy grid in Ukraine is for civilian use. The fact of the matter is energy makes a nation work. It makes a military work and it um, needs to be attacked if you're seeking to degrade um, a nation's ability to continue conflict. It's an approach taken by every nation in times of war. Uh, the United States led a international coalition in 1991 against Iraq, Operation Desert Storm. We initiated that um, conflict with a uh, strategic air campaign that went on for six weeks. The very first target hit was the Iraqi energy grid. Um, so it's hypocritical in the extreme to call what uh, Russia is doing a war crime. It's not a war crime. It cannot be prosecuted under any um, court of jurisdiction. Uh, you You, a prosecutor simply cannot articulate uh, a, a cognizable uh, course of action uh, against Russia. Um, it's absurd to say otherwise. And I think it reflects the fact that Russia's hit a nerve. Um, this is something Russia should have done on day one. Uh, this war would be over by now had they done so. Um, and if Russia is seeking to bring an end to this conflict on terms that are acceptable to Russia, this is the only course of action Russia can take. Der Druck auf das ukrainische Oberkommando ist Berichten zufolge sehr hoch. Wer hat Ihrer Meinung nach das Sagen? The pressure on the Ukrainian military high command is reportedly very high. Who is calling the shots in your opinion? Ukraine's uh, command structure is um, complex. Ostensibly, the commander-in-chief is the Ukrainian president. But... Um, His ability to stand alone is um, it's impossible. He, he cannot stand without the support of NATO, the United States, the European Union, um, and, and, and the collective West, as uh, Vladimir Putin would call it. Uh, also, his relationship with the military is um, complicated as well. The military, when they look at a campaign, They aren't looking at the politics. They're looking at how it relates to the accomplishment of military objectives. Meaning that if you're going to carry out an offensive operation, is it more important to destroy enemy combat capabilities or take territory? From the Zelensky perspective, at a time when there seemed to be some fatigue, in the collective West about continuing this massive support of Ukraine. To what end? Was Ukraine ever going to be able to do something with this weaponry, et cetera? Um, and knowing that he was going to have to ask for many billions of dollars more in assistance, not just military assistance, but economic assistance to pay salaries, to keep Ukraine functioning. Ukraine does not have a functioning economy at this point. Um, he would have to demonstrate that Ukraine can win on the battlefield. And so I think what we what we see is a is a blend of um pressures being placed on Ukraine when it comes to uh how the military operates on the battlefield. And these pressures resulted in an impressive political statement made by the Ukrainian military. We cannot under um you know, underemphasize um, the impressiveness of the Ukrainian operation in Kharkov. They took a lot of territory and they took it very fast. But when you remove the map from the equation, and if someone said, hey, uh, Ukraine just finished a, a two-week operation, they lost uh, 10 to 20,000 guys and they killed 200 Russians, would you call that a Ukrainian victory? And the answer is no. Um, 
or if I said Ukraine committed the totality of its uh, strategic reserve into a battle that failed to destroy the Russians. And now Ukraine has no more strategic reserve at a time when the Russians are building up their military capacity. Would this be a Ukrainian victory? However, what we can say is that because of the Ukrainian offensive, NATO and the United States have committed billions more to the Ukrainian effort. More weaponry is coming, more troops are going to be trained, and there's talk about providing Ukraine with billions of dollars of much needed economic assistance to keep the, 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 the country afloat. So it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, without this offensive, would Ukraine have received this level of support? I think the answer is yes, but it would be difficult to sustain this down the road. Um, so Ukraine is securing its future by sacrificing its troops at the battlefield. But from a military perspective, this is extremely, extremely risky because while one cannot predict the future, um, the Russians um, still have to convince people that they are capable of competence on the battlefield. Uh, the Russian performance has not been stellar. It hasn't been as bad as some people are making it out to be, but there have been many mistakes from the strategic level on down. And um, I, I think people would have a right to say, well, are the Russians really going to be able to finish the job or are they just building these troops up for more lethargy? Um, but if Russia is as good as some analysts think, I think, I personally think they are this good, um, then Ukraine's in a lot of trouble because they've weakened themselves. They've uh, basically burned through their reserves and they don't have a guarantee that more reserves are going to come in a timely fashion. So I think in this one, the the, the different pressures being put on Zelensky um, is actually bad. And the fact that Zelensky felt that he needed to sacrifice his strategic reserve to appease a, um, a West that eight months into the war is no longer viewed as a guaranteed source of support uh, shows some um, fundamental weaknesses in the Ukrainian way of doing business. Die deutsche Außenministerin Annalena Baerbock forderte die Lieferung von Leopard 2 Panzern an die Ukraine und behauptet sogar, dass Waffenlieferungen Leben retten würden. Was halten Sie von solchen Erklärungen führender Politiker und welche Auswirkungen könnten die Leopard 2 Panzer auf dem Schlachtfeld haben? German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock called for the delivery of Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine and even claims that arms deliveries would save lives. How do you see such explanations from leading politicians and what kind of impact could the Leopard 2 tanks have on the battlefield? I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to insult anybody. Um, the Leopard is a good tank. There's no doubt about that. It's not the best tank in the world. So the idea that you could take a tank and put it on a battlefield and suddenly expect a different outcome than that which is already taking place, it's, that's something that can only exist in the minds of amateurs, people who know nothing of war. And frankly speaking, the Green Party of Germany, they know nothing of war. And the German foreign minister knows nothing of war. Uh, they should. They've been watching war taking place for eight months now uh, in Europe. It's a war where um, I, I think it's it's clear that uh, technology alone doesn't carry the day. Uh, technology will only get you so far. Now, if these Greens and your foreign minister can explain how you're going to take a very technically advanced piece of equipment like the Leopard tank. And I think they're also asking for the Martyr infantry fighting vehicle as well, basically to take German technology and transfer it to Ukraine. Question for the Green Party How often does the Leopard 2 tank break down under the normal course of operations? What's the maintenance schedule for a Leopard 2 tank? Because before you send it to Ukraine, you might want to be able to answer that question um, How many spare parts do you need? 
And where should they be located? Forward with the unit so they can maintain it right there on the battlefield? Or do you have to take it to an interim depot, maybe set up in Ukraine where the Russians can hit it while it's being retained? Or will you have to take it back to Poland or to Germany to be repaired? These are questions you might want to ask before you start talking about giving the Ukrainians this equipment. Can Ukrainians operate it? What kind of ammunition does it use? Is the ammunition compatible with the other tanks that the Ukrainians are using? Or are you trying to introduce a whole nother level of complexity for logistical support of the Ukrainian military that's already heads are spinning because so many different weapon systems are being provided with so many different maintenance and logistic sustainability issues and training ability. If you give them a piece of equipment that breaks down, is difficult to sustain logistically, and is more complicated to operate than, say, the T-72 tank, saving lives, you're slaughtering Ukrainian soldiers. You're idiots. You're the kind of people that should be dismissed from government forever. It is brain dead to think that by giving the Ukrainian military this equipment in, in a time of war where they don't have the time and space necessary to absorb it in its totality, not just driving a tank, but having all the sustainability issues around it and the level of proficiency to use it in combat. This isn't about driving around a training ground. This is about using a tank against an enemy that's an expert in tank warfare. The Russians will annihilate the Leopard tank. The Leopard tank will become nothing more than burnt out, rusted hulks of German steel. I think we've seen that picture before. So before Germany starts talking about sending German tanks into Russia to fight Russians, we learn the history books. Go back and read it. It didn't work last time. It's not going to work this time. What the hell are they thinking? I don't mean to get angry at you. I'm not mad at you. But my God, has Germany learned nothing from its history? Mind your own damn business. And quit supporting Stepan Bandera worshiping neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Because that's what you're doing. Focus on fixing your problems at home. Ask yourself as you go through this difficult winter, was it cheap Ukrainian gas that made the German economy work? Or was it cheap Russian gas that makes the German economy work? Is it expensive American liquid natural gas that makes the German economy work? Or was it cheap Russian gas that makes the German economy work? And then ask yourself again, why have you foregone everything that made you succeed as a nation these last couple of decades and thrown it away for what? So the Green Party can say they provided the Ukrainians with leopard tanks when all you're doing is giving German weaponry to Nazis? No, this is stupidity of the highest order. Die UN-Sonderbeauftragte für sexuelle Gewalt, Pramila Patton, wirft Russland Vergewaltigungen als militärische Strategie in der Ukraine vor. Wie bewerten Sie diese Vorwürfe? The UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence, Pramila Patton, accused Russia of using rape as a military strategy in Ukraine. What can you say to such accusations? Yeah, it's, it's what, um, I mean, it's pathetic. It's really pathetic. Am I going to sit here and, and, and tell you that it's impossible for a Russian soldier to commit a war crime? No. Am I going to sit here and tell you that it's impossible for a Russian soldier to rape a Ukrainian woman? No, I'm not going to tell you that at all. Am I going to sit here and tell you that it's systemic, that the Russians encourage Russian soldiers to rape Ukrainian women and give them Viagra to somehow increase their, uh, their potency as men? Uh, that's just a bald-faced lie, straight-up lie. There's no evidence to back it up whatsoever. In fact, we know that it's a lie. We had a Ukrainian official, some human rights lady, who was out there talking over and over again about rape, 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 all lies. Even the Ukrainian government, which sells lies for a living, had to fire her because she was so ridiculous. Russians are carrying out a special military operation in Ukraine. It's war. It's horrible. Tens of thousands of people have lost their lives and more are condemned to death in a war that should have been fought. I'm not sitting here trying to make this out to be some sort of uh, 
you know, dance in the flowers. It's not. It's war. It's horrible. You can't make anything good from it. But you have to respect the fact that the Russians have bent over backwards to minimize the harm done to the Ukrainian citizens. Why, would you ask, would they do this? Because the Russians do believe that Ukrainians and Russians are of one people. They may not be the same people, but they're the Slavic people. They're brothers. You scratch a Ukrainian, you get a Russian. You scratch a Russian, you get a Ukrainian. This is a civil war. In America, I try to explain it as if New Jersey went to war against New York. You know, if, you, if you've ever been to the United States, you know that New York men go down to Atlantic City to chase New Jersey girls and New Jersey girls go into New York City to chase New York men and they get married. And they have families. And they vacation in each place and they love each other. They hate each other. They do what families do. But if you asked all of a sudden for New York to go to war against New Jersey, it would be the most difficult thing in the world because they love them. They are them. They're one and the same, even though they're not. That's Russia and Ukraine. So the idea that Russian boys who have probably a Ukrainian mother or a Ukrainian grandmother or a Ukrainian aunt would go to Ukraine and rape Ukrainian women is disgusting. Not because of the act. Of course, the act is it's disgusting that anybody would make that allegation when the exact opposite is the case. The Russians are laying down their lives to save Ukrainian civilians. It's the Ukrainian army that uses its own population as human shields. I'm not making it up. The Washington Post reported about it, and they're not pro-Russian in any extent. Human Rights Watch did a report where they're almost embarrassed to say it. We don't want to say this, they said, but it's true. The Ukrainians are using Ukrainian civilians as human shields. And it's the Russians that pay the price because Russia would have every right under the law of war to destroy everything in front of it, even if there's a human shield there, if there's a military necessity for the strike. But instead, Russia backs off puts its own forces at risk, loses men. They've lost thousands of men who otherwise wouldn't have died because they're trying to save Ukrainian civilians' life. Is that the action of an army that's feeding Viagra to its troops, telling them to rape the women? No. I mean, this is vile, vile. It plays upon the, the, you know, the fears that, um, that, that, that emerged um, when the Russians occupied Germany and Berlin in 1945. At that time, there were abuses. We know this. It's a historical fact uh, that there were abuses, especially in the immediate aftermath of, of taking over. And um, that I think that scarred Germany, the, the concept. Of that. But then Germany had a chance to live with Soviet soldiers. And even though they weren't happy with being occupied, I don't think you'll find too many Germans that say the Soviets didn't behave properly, that the, the soldiers didn't behave properly. You didn't have gangs of Soviet soldiers marauding East German villages, picking girls up and raping them. It didn't happen that way. Um, and it's not happening today. This is just vile, vile propaganda. I mean, if you want to pick on the Russians, there's a lot to pick on. You know, you know the, you know, the, the soundness of their tactics. Um, you know, things of that nature. Um, but to sit here and manufacture out of whole cloth a false allegation of rape um, is is stupid. It's literally stupid. And again, you know, the New York Post can repeat whatever they want to. That's their editorial choice. That's why they're the New York Post, not the New York Times, even though the New York Times is pretty bad too. But, um, you know, the, the fact is that this is coming from a United Nations official is is disturbing. Um, I worked for the United Nations for a number of years. It's supposed to be a fact-based organization where facts and truth carry weight and lies and distortions are dismissed. But it appears the United Nations has, has flipped and they're allowing somebody to say this. She, the person who promulgated this should be fired immediately, fired immediately, lose their job. Germany should be leading the way and demanding the resignation of this individual. Because Germany knows the truth about how Russians behave when they're, you know, uh, it, it's just, just, 
It's disturbing. It's bad. It's stupid. But it's not going to change anything. I mean, the bottom line is all the purpose of all this propaganda is to rally the world against Russia and to demoralize Russians at home. Um, Russia is more unified today than it's ever been. Support for Vladimir Putin stronger than it's ever been. If you take a look at the world, they're getting tired of this conflict and they're starting to ask questions that should have been asked on day one. Questions that were brought up by a German journalist, by the way, when interviewing the uh, Ukrainian ambassador to Germany about his proclivity to visit the grave of one Stepan Bandera. Wow, maybe you should talk more about that, um, this UN, you know, whatever you were. Uh, no, it, it, I think Europe's getting tired of this conflict. And so, in order to get people riled up against Russia, they're going to need more and more fantastic stories about the horrific nature of the Russians, crimes committed by the Russians. But it's all it is is a story. There's no facts to back it up. 